everyone. Welcome to this week's uh, DDU Viva Cases. I'm Emma. I'm one of the um, intensivists at Nepean and welcome. We've just been having a little chat with everyone there with Robert, uh, Hirwan and Chathari. So I might start with, um, if you don't want to be asked any questions, maybe just uh, go off video or something. You can just listen in. It's up to you. But um, Hirwan hasn't yet signed up for the DDU, so we'll just... Well, um, maybe interject if you want to ask anything, hey, Juan. Um, otherwise, I'll not I'll not ask you um, anything. All right. Yeah, that'd be um, great. So we might start with a relatively. So this, I I thought I'd show a few valvular cases um, for everyone. So this first one is um, one that I reported just a couple of days ago. Um, are you okay to talk through this one, Robert? I might ask you some questions about uh, it. But we've got a sixty-seven-year-old man who presented to ED with shortness of breath and presyncope. And the indication was, is there a cardiogenic cause for this? So do you want to, I might ask you a few questions as we go through, but are you able to comment on this um, this initial loop? Sure, uh, this is parasternal long axis view. Um, you can see the anterior septal inferior lateral walls in this view and to my eye on this screen, it appears that the, they're moving and probably sickening okay, maybe slightly to, slightly down. Um, seeing as this is a valvular talk, I'll concentrate. I can see that perhaps there's some calcification around the aortic valve and there's a bit of artifacts there. Um, but it, it appears to be opening. And then the mitral valve. Um, I'm questioning whether the, there may be some prolapse of that mitral valve. Uh, it's not particularly clear on this picture. Yeah, I agree. The, the image quality isn't isn't great, is it? But you do, so normal lymph, left ventricular size and systolic function, it seems to be in these uh, walls anyway. But yeah, they see how thickened this looks. I, I completely agree. Um, we'll just move on to the next one. It's a bit hard to see the mitral valve there as well. Okay, what do you have? Uh, this is a zoomed in view of the aortic valve. Um, again, I can see that there's heavy calcification there and when zoomed in, it appears like that perhaps it's not, uh, there's not full excursion of that valve, it's not opening properly. Yeah. Do you have any, would you say sort of mildly reduced opening, moderate or severely reduced opening based on just this parasternal long axis? Um, I'd say moderate to severe, hedge my bets. Yeah, it's hard to, hard to say, isn't it? You want to look in more views, but it does look significant. It looks at least moderate, I would say. All right. Uh, so this is color flow Doppler across the aortic valve, and you can see there's frequency aliasing there, um, suggesting that there may be some turbulence flow going through that valve. Um, and that appears to happen during systole, so presumably some aortic stenosis there. Yeah, absolutely turbulent flow. Just what what would you want to just uh, double check if you see that turbulent flow in terms of your settings? Uh, so I'd check my Nyquist limit, which on your picture here is 60, so that's 62, so that's appropriate. Yeah, what range would be normal for that Nyquist limit? As Well, normally I would set it between 60 and 80 uh, for, for a high, when looking at something of high velocity. Yeah, so. mine's, mine's sort of 55 to, to 70, but um, okay. yeah. Um, can you see just that there is turbulence through that and there's a little bit of regurgitation as well? You see that just in diastole, just where my cursor is? Oh, yes, I can see that now that you've pointed it out. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right. Again, this is a zoomed in view of the aortic valve and there's uh, confirmation of that turbulent flow in systole. And then again, I think perhaps a little bit in diastole as well. Yeah, so tell me what you want, what your thought process is so far, Robert, and what you want to see next to try to help you with that. So my thought process is that the, the, there's likely aortic stenosis that's been confirmed in two-dimensional two now color flow imaging. Um, I'd like to look at the aortic valve from uh, sort of an on-foss view, uh, see if see what what the if it's a trileaflet or if there's 
and then um, I would like to uh, do some spectral Doppler through it as well. Very nice. All right. So this is um, again. It's not easy to image this guy, but this is just a. Um, what what can we see here actually? So this is explained through the uh, aortic valve, and you can see. Um, I can't see a lot. There's a lot of artifact, but presumably that's secondary to the heavy calcification and being difficult to image. I wouldn't be able to. I wouldn't be able to comment on whether this is a trileaflet or or other aortic valve, whether it's by 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 leaflet or I can't tell from this picture. Sorry. I agree. The image quality is not good enough to be sure it's tricuspid. Hey, um, what do you think about the the leaflet opening in terms of how restricted it it appears? I think it confirms that. It's the leaflet openings not good and it'd be at least moderate to severely restricted. Nice, nice. All right, so we talked about or oh, just tell me the walls that we can see here. So this is parasternal, that's short yeah. axis view. I just point put my can you see my little hat uh, cursor yeah. there? Yeah. So we'd be near the anterior septal wall there. Yeah. And then anterior wall. Yeah. Uh lateral wall. Anterior, uh, anterior yeah. lateral, yeah. Uh, inferior lateral, inferior septal, uh, yeah, anterior septal. Yeah, so inferior, inferior septal, anterior septal. Yeah. Nice. What papillary muscle is this? Um, oh, I've forgotten its name. The Presumably it's the anterior lateral or something. <laughs> In this one? Yeah. Uh, Inferior medial or something? Yeah, I think it's it's yeah, it should be inferior medial, probably shouldn't it? But it's still got it's still called posterior medial. But posterior yeah, medial. lateral and posterior medial. Um, we'll talk about those in another time. Good. All right. So there's that. Um, this is a zoomed in. It's a hard to see. It's zoomed in on the aortic valve with some color. Um, again, just showing that flow turbulence. We'll move on from that. All right. Just name the walls for me and tell me what you think about the uh, the you know, the left ventricular function and anything else that you can point out that looks significant. So this is uh, apical four chamber view. Um, you can see the inferior septal and anterior lateral walls. Um, the, on this view, I actually think that it appears that they probably are thickening more than 30%. So it's probably normal. Uh, but looks thickened and hypertrophied, which is what you expect in aortic stenosis. Yeah, so we're getting, um, even in that short axis view, you couldn't see the wall thickness very well on the parasternal lung, but we're getting the impression that there's left ventricular hypertrophy. And systolic function is normal, isn't it? I'd say the EF yeah. is at least so 55, 60. Um, good. Um, anything about the mitral valve? It's obviously not a big part of what we're talking about today, but... Uh, the mitral valve appears to be opening normally and um, co-opting normally. I can't, uh, maybe it's mildly thickened. Yeah, I would say it's mildly thickened and there's a little bit of mild mitral annular calcification. See the sort of bright little spots of calcium here? Yep. Um, but we'll not focus on that too much. All right, what do we have here? Uh, so this is the five chamber focusing on the aortic valve with color flow Doppler across that. Um, so confirmation again of turbulent flow during systole and then there's also some some flow during diastole as well presumably that, that that's well that will be the aortic regurgitation you can see there yeah I might just slow that down for everyone so yeah as we're going come here so we've got flow in systole there you can see that we sort of and quite often in sort of moderate to severe aort or severe aortic stenosis you don't always see that a lot of color coming through you know distal to the valve so we're not seeing too much of that there coming through and that's just a sort of subjective thing that you can look at and then just oh let's come back all right, so flow in systole, very turbulent and you see how we're getting that proximal flow convergence just um just proximal to the aortic valve. So just a small thing, when you're measuring VTI for your continuity equation, which we'll come to, you want to be outside that flow convergence zone because you're going to overestimate your LV or TVTI and therefore underestimate the severity of AS. But um, I just want to show you as that's coming through, then at the end, 
just that very tra- you know little trace of mm. very good which is important to to know sort of the um the severity of the regurg because of course that's going to affect your gradients what we'll come on to next and um, what walls are we looking at here so this is the apical three chamber well it looks like it's going into three chamber view yeah um, which would be the same as your parasitic long axis so anterior septal inferior lateral walls very nice and what uh, mitral leaflets are we looking at so you can see anterior mitral valve leaflet and posterior mitral valve leaflet on the left hand side of the screen yeah and what do you know what scallops they would be in this view a2 and p2 very nice a2 p2 and what do you think of the aortic valve again here in 2d uh heavily calcified and uh minimal it looks like it's restricted in motion not opening well yes. so again you can see that flow convergence and um, frequency aliasing the turbulent flow through the aortic valve yeah with uh, again uh, some trace aortic regurgitation uh, this is our uh, continuous wave doppler through the aortic valve um, and you can see that the aortic valve maximal velocity is almost approaching four meters per second so uh, it'd be moderate at least aortic stenosis on on those ones yep so tell me about your cutoffs between like what what you're looking at there so you've talked about the peak velocity um yeah. being around say 3.7 3 as well 3.8 a is our maximum 3.9 um, so what are your cutoffs for severe? So greater than four meters per second would be severe. Yeah. And what else would you look at as well as the peak velocity? Um, so you can calculate the mean gradient by tracing it out. Um, and so greater than 40 millimeters of mercury would be severe. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So currently based on these we're in the moderate, moderate category, you would say. Yes, uh, you would need to assess from other of other views to confirm. Perfect, perfect, absolutely. So, you, so these are all taken from the apical windows, um, and we know that in you know sort of twenty percent or so of patients, if we just use the apical windows, we will underestimate severity. Um, so, this is actually taken from the subcostal view. It's, it's unusual to get the maximal velocity from the subcostal view, but occasionally you do. Um, do you know what other windows you might look at to interrogate aortic severity? Um, I think you can do a, not that I've ever done it, but you can do a right-sided parasternal nice. view. Nice. Right? Yeah. Uh, and presumably you could do a, um, uh, what's the name? A, a super clavicular, superclavicular view. Super, right, superclavicular, um, yeah. suprasternal maybe, not so much. Um, yes, and then right parasternal, absolutely. And it's really important to look at, especially when you're in this sort of territory where you're thinking 2D looks severe, but uh, the gradients, I'm only getting a moderate. So you need to go hunting for that highest gradient, essentially. Um, yeah. And I guess a little tip from this one is don't forget the subcostal window, which we can sometimes, you know, this subcostal window here can sometimes give you the highest gradient. Um, the right sternal edge using your PDOF probe. So that's what this is here. This is not yep. this patient. Um, so the key sort of take home from this case is interrogate all the windows because um, you'll you'll definitely miss it if you don't do that. Um, what else would you want? So you've got the you've got kind of not a very good look at the the valve in two D because it's very poor quality imaging, but your gradients are telling you now that this is in sort of severe territory what else do you want to do as well as your gradients to confirm that so what are the other parameters of of severe aortic stenosis oh no um with echocardio um so you know, other measurements you can do to confirm yeah. uh would be the dimensionless index yeah how do we do that um i knew you were going to ask me that and i i'm not sure sorry oh that's okay um, and the continuity equation. Very nice. Yeah. So we'll, we might leave the calculation of the DSI, dimensionless severity index or dimensionless velocity index, sometimes DVI. We might that leave that to chat for the next case, actually. But um, this is not very, this is the same patient, um, not very good quality uh, VTIs. 
Um, but we have, and I might just, and we've got sort of by the continuity equation a valve area of point, point 0.8 using the VTI with the continuity equation. But I'm, I'm going to leave some of these other numbers just for, for the next case. Um, but good okay. job. That was um, that was nice spotted. I think it really all hinges. It really, um, we sometimes move too quickly onto color and spectral Doppler, but it's really all about your 2D, um, you know, really, really interrogating that as well. Because um, if your gradients are not fitting what you're seeing with 2D, then you know you need to go hunting a little bit more. So that's, uh, oh, and just I thought I'd put this in. It's nothing to do with his, well, I suppose it is to do with his aortic stenosis. He's got thick ventricular walls. But what have you uh, looked at any diastology yet, Robert, with your, yeah, what do you think? Uh, so this is uh, uh, this patient's uh, diastolic parameters. What do you think of them? Um, so on the top left screen, you can see the, E prime velocity is low um, of the, that's the septal E prime velocity. And then uh, what's, the, norm, what's normal for that? Uh, I think it was age dependent. Um, what, but, what's uh, in the diastolic dysfunction guideline, the ASC diastolic dysfunction guideline? Because it does change with age, right? But the from, memory, from memory, it's greater than uh, 0 0.07. Yeah, very nice. Yep. Yeah. So seven centimeters per second, or yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Our um, machine gives us it in meters per second. So his is three centimeters per second. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then again, it's uh, that's the lateral wall e, e prime velocity. Uh, oh no, sorry, that's uh, I, I can't see which one you've measured there. No, you have measured the e prime yeah. velocity again. And that again is low, it's um, five centimeters per second, which is what you'd expect in someone with um, aortic stenosis and left ventricular hypertrophy. You'd yeah. expect them to have diastolic dysfunction. Yeah, you would be. Um, what's the normal for lateral? Oh, it should be faster. Uh, maybe nice. eight. Yeah, it's 10, so greater than or equal yeah. to. Okay. In, in yeah. the that's good um or right, i've just given you what the e velocity and the e to a ratio is there mm -hmm. uh, and what of these are the things that we've got um so you've measured out the size of the left atrium yeah uh, which i think that's normal size so um, what's the what's the normal uh, cutoff should be ooh. Or is it? Oh no, that maybe it's a bit big. Um, I can't remember. Sorry, Emma, I can't remember the, those values yet. Yeah, all good. Um, so more than thirty-four mils per meter squared, uh, greater than or equal to thirty-four. So it is um, enlarged. Although that's using the area length method, not method of discs. But um, anyway, it is mild, mildly dilated the left atrium. Yeah. And how about what's the cutoff for what are we seeing here, uh, Robert? Uh, so you're looking at the you're calculating the pulmonary artery pressure by the tricuspid regurgitation maximal velocity um, and using the simplified Bernoulli equation. So it's, it's 41 there. You can see it's giving you the value for um, yeah. pulmonary systolic pressure would be 41 plus right atrial pressure. Very nice. Yeah. What's the relevance of that in the diastolic dysfunction guidelines? Do you know what the cutoffs they use? Uh, no, I don't. Sorry. Yeah, so it's a TRV max of more than or equal to 2.8 is okay. one of the other parameters, isn't it? This is the, we've, we've moved. So do you know the two different algorithms in, in the diastolic dysfunction guidelines? Have you? Yeah, so there's one with normal ejection fraction. Yeah. And then there was well, obviously one with reduced or if they have risk factors, I think, from memory, such as... Um, coronary art, like known ischemic heart disease yes yeah yeah so structural structural heart disease and things so he he would fall into that second one mm -hmm. um, you know with his thick walls and his aortic stenosis and things like that um mm -hmm. and so yeah he he would fall maybe just re recap those um those guidelines and have a look through so with his e to a of 1.6 you know he's not going to go down that first arm or the last one of you know if his e to a was more than two that would be severe grade three diastolic dysfunction so he he comes into that middle uh, category which is where we need to look at three other parameters okay so we look at his e over e prime and if that's more than 14 more than or equal to 14, if your TRV max is more than 2.8 and your um, left atrial 
a LAVI, your left atrial volume index is more than 34, um, then you've got, if you have more than two out of three of those, you go into grade two or moderate diastolic dysfunction. Yeah. And really that, why that's important for us as intensivists is because it helps us to then differentiate those with normal versus le raised left atrial pressures, because that's going to change how we manage them in terms of their fluid management, diuresis, um, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought I'd just put that in. It wasn't really uh, related. Um, chat, do you want to do this? I can't see you, but do you want to do this uh, second one? Uh, yep, I'll do my best. Um so this is a parasternal long axis view. Uh, the Sorry, most... chat, I, might, I might just give you the clinical indication. So this chap was in his 70s and presented with um, hypotension and he'd had some arrhythmias. 70s and hypotension and arrhythmias. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the, the film clip bar is over the rhythm strip, so I can't quite, oh, now it's better. Um, so he looks like he is in a sinus rhythm there. This is a parasternal long axis view. The most prominent feature to me at the moment is the heavily restricted, severely restricted um, aortic valve, which is not opening very much at all. The mitral valve looks like it's opening and closing pretty well. The left atrium looks a little bit dilated in this um in this view and the left ventricle also looks significantly impaired in this view um i don't i i can't convince convince myself that it's dilated but the thickening that i can see in the um antraceptal and infralateral walls is um reduced the right right ventricle is hard to comment on in this view but doesn't look overtly large yeah. And if you had to, instead of saying significant chat, if you had to say mild, moderately or severely reduced for that LV systolic function and also for, you already said, you said severely restricted for the aortic valve. What would you say um, for the left ventricle yeah. in this? I think the left ventricle is severely impaired in this view. So I think in the DDU, they do want you to sort of rather than say significant, like, you know, just make a call and say this is only in one view, like preface it with obviously this is a single view, but the left ventral, left ventricle systolic function looks moderately impaired to me, you know, just sort of make a hedge your bets a little bit. Um, just sounds a, a little bit slicker. All right. Nice. So color Doppler through the aortic valve um it looks like there are two jets coming through the aortic valve the flow through the valve looks accelerated but the lvot actually doesn't look very fast at all and i suspect that's because of its his impaired ventricle there's also a jet of mitral regurgitation that i can see just on the end of that color box very nice oh sorry Wow, it's tight, isn't it? Um, it's a calcified, severely stenosed aortic valve. Um, that's the most obvious feature to me. It's a really nice look of the pulmonary artery as well. You can see the pulmonic valve well, and uh, you can see the branches of the pulmonary artery quite well in this um short axis um view. I think you can also see a central line or some kind of catheter floating around in the RV um that we can see there. Sorry, in the RA that I can see there as well. Yeah. It's actually a pacing wire. It looks a little bit in an odd position, but he did have a, a pacing wire in. He was in a paced rhythm. It doesn't look yeah that obvious there. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this chat? Comment on the so, what you can Yeah, see. so parasternal short axis um, is what I'm seeing here with the tricuspid valve at the top there. Uh, I actually think the posterior wall looks like it's down um, in this uh, view through the mitral valve. Um, so... So I'm going to put my cursor on the walls chat and I want you to say whether they're normal, hypokinetic or akinetic. Yeah. And just say what they are. So that's the the interventricular septum and... What part of it? 
So that's the you've got it on the anterior part. Yep. So yep. So that septum. septum. Yep. Yeah. And it's 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 just let me just well, give me one second. Yeah. Regional walls, I think, is the hardest part of echocardiography, I think. Just make a call. It might not be, I, you know, I might not be right with this either. So I think it, I think it is thickening, but it is not thickening much. And I think it's, so I don't think it's akinetic, although now I think it is akinetic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's akinetic. Yeah, go for it. All right. What's this wall? And what, what is this? So the anterior wall looks like it's impaired, but it is thickening and um what what part of the um yeah nice okay so what you're calling this one i'm calling that one the antraceptal no this one's antraceptal i'm uh, sorry the anterior wall yeah nice and what are you what are you grading it i think i think it's moving and i think it's down so i think it's not a kinetic it is hypokinetic and i think it is severely hypokinetic but it is thickening Yep. So what what do you have in your mind for when so when you go sort of from normal to hypokinetic to akinetic in terms of the percentage thickening, just sort of eyeballing? So normally is at least 30% thickening. Um and hypokinetic, I kind of think is somewhere around the 20 to 15% thickening, and then akinetic, I think is, you know, 10 to zero, zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have 50 for me. So more than 50 normal, less than 50 hypo, and then sort of less than okay. like no, no thickening or less than 10% than a kinetic. But okay. just, uh, all right, what have I got my cursor on here? And what, what are you calling that? So that's antralateral and it's thickening, but impaired. I'd say hypo. Okay. I think that looks, that looks reasonable to me, but. Yeah, yeah I actually agree with you. I think it's yeah. normal. What about this one? um so that's infralateral and it is this normal. one yep yeah. yep yeah, good this one and that's the inferior wall and I actually see it very well on this but I get the impression that it is thickening normal yeah it's hard to see because there's a bit of dropout isn't there and you'd like to see that in more views but it doesn't yeah good as, the, as these walls to me so it doesn't look as good as that antralateral and the inferior um so the yeah. yeah so I think it might this might be a little bit hypokinetic and then we're coming to the infraceptal which also looks a bit hypokinetic as well um yeah I think in the ex well in real life you just have to make a call and sort of you know um and you might not always get it get it right. Maybe ask for a second opinion if you're unsure. But um, often yeah. it's the thing that we we often get second opinions because it's it's really quite difficult regional uh, segmental function. This one's actually quite a nice image quality, but especially if you can't see you know two contiguous segments, then you we should really be you know giving using more contrast and um, yeah. if we want to get accurate accurate assessment. Um, there is a little bit of diastolic flattening as well, isn't there of the of the septum? Um, yeah. Yes. Um, and also it's a paced rhythm as well. So we're getting that tiny little bit of. So this was the thing that made me question the akinesis of the septum, because if he's yeah. got a pacemaker, then it's going to be dyskinetic anyway. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But we can't see, you can't see thickening. So you no think it's, paced, yeah, it's, the thick, it's the thickening. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely right about the dyskinesia, which can sometimes be yeah. tricky. Um, all right, just briefly, what are the walls that we're seeing? And um, we'll com yeah, comment on the aortic valve again. Uh, so infralateral antraceptal, heavily yeah. calcified, thickened aortic valve that I actually can't appreciate much opening on at the moment. So it seems severely stenotic or restricted. All right, comment on this uh, profile. So and this is um, continuous wave Doppler through what looks like an apical three chamber um, aortic valve. Uh, and the main things of note is interestingly, despite the 2D appearance, the VMAX um, and the mean gradients through the aortic valve are not particularly high and probably more reflective of the impaired ventricle than um, the severity of aortic stenosis on Doppler alone. So three point Point two puts him in the moderate category, uh, Vmax. Um, 
and the mean gradient of 24 is um, 40 is kind of we'll put him into severe. So he's kind of in the moderate to mild category, I think, with a mean yep. gradient of 24. Yep, yep. So 20 to 30, 30 to 40, more than 40 for mean gradient. Yeah. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? What do you, critiquing yeah. the um, continuous wave Doppler um, trace, what do you think of that? Anything you would change or...? The the ang the the angle of Doppler incidence is a little bit off. Like I don't think we're right nicely through the middle of the aortic valve. There, it does look like a fairly complete envelope, um, and it does slightly maybe overgain just looking at the brightness towards the um, towards the baseline. Uh, I think that yeah, that's just where the most of the red blood cells are coming through there. Hey, initially, yeah. So it's brighter and it tapers off as it comes through. Um, yeah. Nice. Okay. What do you, so what do you think of the shape of the profile? What would you expect for more severe aortic stenosis? Would you expect it to be triangular or more rounded and parabolic? Uh, for more severe aortic stenosis, I expect it to be, um, more parabolic yeah very so nice. um yeah 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 nice um all right what have we got here so this is an apical five chamber through the aortic valve um with color doppler through it and i think it further um confirms the impression that the left ventricle is severely impaired um and the Color Doppler velocity through the aortic valve, given what I think of the 2D severity, um, is not particularly turbulent or as fast as what I would expect it to be. Yeah, and you can hardly see any flow coming through there, can you? Yeah. It's in the case with the severe AS as well. All right, this one. Uh, so this is another continuous wave Doppler through the aortic valve now in the five chamber. Um, and again, we're not getting very high Doppler parameters for severity of aortic valve. So 3.325 puts him in the moderate to mild category on Doppler. Yeah. What do you, um, so what do you want to see, what your thought process is now, chat, and what do you want to see um, with you? What do you want to interrogate with Echo to try to put piece it together? Because, yeah. So you could look at the... Or you just cut in off. the aorta and in the LVOT and compare the velocity ratios. Yeah, very nice. Um, so you're thinking that on 2D it looks severe, right? But your gradients and your Vmax are not concordant with that. So you've you've sort of putting together that this is sort of discordant. Um yeah. want more more information, absolutely. Um so as I was just saying here, you know, query moderate, it doesn't look anything like moderate, does it? It looks a lot worse yeah. than um, you know, looking like that. Yeah. So more information, essentially. Um, yeah. so exactly as you mentioned. So we need to start doing, you know, continuity equation for aortic valve area and also a sort of a simplified version of that, which is the DSI or, you know, DVI, whatever you want to call it. Um, what's the advantage of, so tell me, can you tell me the continuity equation? So we've got here 0.73, how we would work that out for the aortic. So Area. It, the aortic valve area is the LVOT VTI times the LVOT diameter divided by the aortic valve VTI. Beautiful, yeah. And it's not the it's not just the diameter of the LVOT. What what is it of the LVOT? Oh, cross sectional area. I beg your pardon. Yeah, perfect. Um, very nice. So, would you be happy with this this tracing for the LVOT VTI? It's giving us thirteen point three and. Yeah, I mean, it's not a great chase of an LVOT VTI. There's no closing click. There isn't an opening click, which is good. The density of colour is okay. It's quite sharp. Um, and yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Just be mindful, obviously, um, you know, in severe aortic stenosis, we don't often see that closing click either. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the, the main thing with, with this is to 
in him there was no proximal flow convergence so there was it was quite laminar sort of leading up to it wasn't it um so the placement's probably fine but yeah maybe we could have optimized uh, the gain settings a little bit maybe just turned that down a little bit the the baseline could have been brought down a little bit more as well and um, but yeah. i think you know, velocity reject is probably okay because often you see big black sort of um like ghosting like black um blackness there so you don't get that full tracing but can you see how we've just cut out the end part of that as well um, oh yeah you get too early yeah. so that can yeah. Um, yeah just make sure you, you don't do that too often and yeah, yeah. if they're in, he's in a sort of a paced regular rhythm but obviously if they're in af um you either want to match your rr intervals from your continuous wave and your pulse wave through the lvot so you want matching yeah. our intervals um, or you want to average sort of at least five. Um, okay. Right. And we'll talk through some of the numbers that we can see there. So, yeah, just as you were saying there, chat. So we're going to do VTI times by the cross-sectional area over the VTI. And his is 0.73. So I've told you the answer there. But what, what would be a normal valve area? If you know this already. Um, less than one is severe. And yeah. yeah. Uh, and one and a half, yeah, to one yeah. moderate, yeah, and two, one and a half to two is mild, and and but beyond that, it's normal. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, like more than or, more, than, yeah, than two and a half. Yeah. Um, good. And then this is the how do we calculate dimensionless severity index, and what are its uh, advantages over this one, the aortic valve area? So dimensionless severity index is good in that it just compares, it's got less measurements. So you have less sources of error and it is not dependent on LV function. So you're just comparing um, pressure gradients across the valve. And so the LV function doesn't impact as much on, um, on the assessment. Uh, yeah, I suppose you're taking, well, you, you're taking, um, you're sort of correcting, hey, because you've got your LVOT VTI over your aortic valve VTI. Um, yeah. So it does help you out, like the aortic valve area obviously helps you out if you've got low gradients, but the valve doesn't look that way. But the main yeah. thing is that, as you said, you're not um, using, you don't need to use your LVOT diameter, which is a big source of error because you're squaring the radius um, in that calculation. And um, especially with calcific um, aortic valve disease, it's really quite hard to, to know that you're um, cutting in the right plane, you know, through yeah. the aortic valve area, but um yeah, so that's its that's its main advantage, but of course the big disadvantage of it is it hasn't got as much prognostic data as aortic valve area has. Okay. Um, I guess that's coming through. So the DSI for this patient was 0.2. Um, what do you think of that, and what's your sort of cutoffs for DSI in aortic stenosis? 0.25. I feel like severe yeah. is less than 0.25. Yeah, nice. And moderate. Moderate must be. <laughs> point three, point four, and 0.5 must be mild to normal yeah I love your work so yeah 0.25 to 0.5 uh, moderate and then more than 0. 0.5 yeah yeah um so his is 0. 0.2 so again we're getting that valve area of 0. 0.73 squared right so severe DSI is 0. 0.2 so severe um so what we're left with now then is discordance, right? We've got discordant grading using our um, using our gradients and Vmax. They're telling us it's moderate, but our 2D assessment to us, it looks severe. It's really heavily calcified, restricted opening. And then backing that up, we've got the DSI, which is in the severe category, and we've got the aortic valve area, which is in severe category. So we've got that discordance, discordant grading. Yeah. So then you've mentioned as you as we were going through that there's you know moderate to severe LV dysfunction. Um, so what's a really key parameter then to to then look at? I'm kind of giving it away a little bit here at the bottom. Um, I don't know what you um a key parameter to look at. So what you've said you... also e the EF is definitely less than fifty percent, isn't it? So yeah, that's one thing. But there's something about um. Yeah, there's another key key parameter to look at. So we can look at projection fraction. We can look yeah. at um, the Doppler features of the aortic valve itself. We can yeah. look at the continuity in the DSI. Um, yeah. 
We what can do, do you mean like stress tests to try and improve, like demonstrate a, a LV? So you can do like a dobutamine stress test and re <laughs> reassess the numbers on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On... So, but what you want to know, right, is whether you're dealing with a, a, a low flow state. Yeah. Or, a, or a normal flow state right yeah so i guess that that's that's key like you need to know whether the lv is impaired because the aortic valve is so stenosed and it's dealing against such a big afterload or whether there's something else that's caused the lv to impair and replacing the valve won't necessarily help this problem that yeah that, that's really true and i guess that's um really sort of um talking about whether there's stroke work recruitability or whether there's recruit like flow, you know, um, preload recruitability, I suppose, with the myocardium. Um, but before we get to that, there's an there's even more sim simple than that chat is you want to know whether you're dealing with a low flow state or a normal flow state. All right. Uh -huh. And the parameter that you want to look at for that is the stroke volume through your LVOT indexed. Okay. All right, so that's um, and the magic number for that is less than 35 mils per meter squared. Then you're dealing with a low flow state. Okay. All right, so not all patients with an EF of less than 50, as you know, will have a low flow state, right? You know, the big dilated cardiomyopathies might have normal flow states, right? And I'll talk about, so that, and that group would be the classical low flow, low gradient okay. aortic stenosis. And then that's when you want to give them a drug to test their recruitability and whether they've got flow. So the key to another flow reserve, if they've got flow reserve, i.e. when you give them an inotrope, do they improve their stroke volume and flow? Um, so then, so this is what this patient has, right? He has low flow because it's 23.4, low gradient. So, well, we think mm -hmm. he's got severe aortic stenosis, right? Based on his a the 2D, the aortic valve area and the DSI. But what we now want to differentiate, so we've identified that he's classic low flow, low gradient, severe AS, but what we need now need to know is whether it's true severe or pseudo severe. Yeah. Right. And that's when you would do the debutamine stress echo if, if you feel like it's safe to do that. Um, yeah. Or, you know, this obviously, this is cardiology territory, isn't it really? But, um, you know, whether that you're dealing with that and or and if they can't tolerate that, maybe you would go on to do something like a, a CT calcium scoring or something. Um, you, you do need to know that for your American exams, like they love to ask these kind of, kind of questions. I And, you know, they this is fair game, I think, just knowing the principles of this, especially for the written. Um, I doubt they'd go into the nuances okay. in, a, in a viva necessarily. But so you essentially give them dibutamine and actually this guy probably not the best drug for him to be on but he was actually on dibutamine at the time of this echo so, <laughs> <laughs> so we were just stopped but uh, but he had no um he had no flow reserve so he wasn't able to augment his flow um which is a really poor prognostic sign in of itself so if patients are not doing that, they're all, they're in a, a, a worse prognostic category anyway. But essentially, in true severe AS, you would give the dibutamine DSE, and that normal you know in, in patients that have recruitability, that would normalize that normalize their flow state, and their aortic valve area, which we've just calculated through our continuity equation, would stay less than one centimeter squared, but their pressure gradient would then increase to more than forty, and that's true severe aortic stenosis where in pseudo severe as you normalize that flow it's actually the low flow state that's just not able to generate the pressure to open the valve so in fact when you normalize their flow state their valve opens and their pressures fall um so you know stay less than less than so severe cutoff so less than 40 does that make sense yeah yeah so yeah so i guess for severe so for aortic stenosis it's all about you know, the, the 2D features, again, is key, just emphasizing that, like in the, the first case, knowing your cutoffs for severe, you know, and, and knowing that table that we're all familiar with. So it's going to be peak velocity, mean gradient, DSI, aortic valve area, which is less than one or less than 0.6 centimeter squared per meter squared in terms of indexed aortic valve area. And then, so that's how we would do it, right? But then you have those special categories, which are the low flow, low gradients which are classical, which is this patient, because he's got a reduced EF, less than 50, and he's got a low flow. So we call that classic low flow, low gradient. But you will have cases, another special circumstance is patients like this, where you actually have a normal ejection fraction. 
but you get this paradoxical low flow, low gradient, right? And that's the patients that have got big chunky ventricles um, and small cavities. So, you know, typically, I guess what we would see is little sort of elderly females that have that really small LV cavity. And even though they've got a normal ejection fraction, they still actually have a low flow state, right? So this patient, this, you know, drawing here, 28 mils per meter squared. And these are the groups where you won't get those high gradients either. But rather than because the EF is normal, these groups are called paradoxical low flow, low gradient. And I guess in, in these cases as well, you should always look for mitral regurg because if all that blood is going through back into the left atrium um, and not coming through the LVOT, then you're going to have a, a low gradient um, in those sort of circumstances as well. So that's a caveat to look at. So yeah, special circumstances would be... Um, um, you know, so classic low flow, low gradient or paradoxical low flow, low gradient. Anyway, I think we've gone on about that too much. And then another thing to be aware of um, is this nice case. So maybe, um, I don't know, who we, is there anyone that wants to just volunteer? I'll just quickly go through it because we're kind of running out of time. I want to show you some other stuff. But 70 year old female, syncopal episode, very severe AS, and she was difficult to to image. Um, we can see this is really poor spectral Doppler trace. It's really highly gained because they weren't able to get much through. It's somewhere about three and a half, right? Anyway, this lady went straight to a call. So, um, as you, chat or Robert, do you want to, to maybe comment on what we can see? Think, oh, Ravi, 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 sorry. No, we'll have Ravi actually. Sorry, Ravi. Ravi was keen to comment. Yeah. <laughs> Um, sorry, Ravi, thank you. So you, you heard the story there. Yeah, so it's a transesophageal uh, uh, long, uh, long axis, which is showing the aortic valve, which is uh, opening quite well. And uh, I can see some uh, ecogenic uh, material attached just uh, inferior like uh, towards the ventricular side of the LVOT. This here, Ravi? That one, yeah. Yeah, very so nice. Could, uh, maybe a, like a you know, subvalvular stenosis or uh, some sort of a membrane. Yeah, maybe just tell me your differentials for that before we go on to... Um, yeah, so what would your differentials for this little structure here be? So this differentials, you know, it is mobile. So it could be first because it's only single view. It could be an artifact, and I would like to confirm in other views. Uh, there it could be a infective endocarditis vegetation or a tumor mass or uh, uh, it's not coming from the valve. I can't see it's coming from the valve or like, you know, Lambel's excrescences, uh, which could be uh, one of the differentials. Yeah. Or, uh, yeah. Usually the Lambel's excrescences will be sort of on the like little fine fibrin things, right, attached to the valves. So it doesn't look like uh, that. Yeah. yeah. But you're absolutely right to state all of those things. And if ever they ask you for a mass in the viva, you just, you just rattle off, you know, your usual things, thrombus, tumor, vegetation, could be artifact. I tend probably not to say artifact first, Ravi, just in your order, um, you know, because it doesn't look particularly typical of that. And I'd, I'd always just put artifact lower down on your um, list and then just have your, you know, your sort of quick bullet points for how you would interrogate the mass and, you know, um, biplane, look in many different views, put some color over it, um, you know, assess it in yeah, multiple, multiple views. Um maybe turn down the gain settings, um, um maybe put your optimize your focal point, you know, sort of narrow the sector width, increase temporal resolution, and maybe put M mode through it to see if it's independently mobile. All these sort of simple things that you can you just have a list of things if they ask you in the Viber that you just sort of rattle off. Can I just ask you, Ravi, just point and shoot, what valve what scallop are we looking at here? So that's the anterior uh, mitral leaflet. Yep, yep. And could uh, be the A1. Yeah, ten. I mean, it's it's a little bit hard, isn't it? And you wouldn't be able to fully tell. But in the um, at your sort of one twenty view, it tends to be uh, A two, but it might mm -hmm. be a little bit of A one there. You're right, and uh, P two, which we can't see. Apologies. And what aortic cusps are we looking at? 
What's this one where my little pointer is? So that the right uh, coronary yeah. cusp. Yeah. And other could be left or uh, non coronary. Absolutely. Yeah, it's hard to tell in in just that single plane, isn't it? Lovely. All right. What do you think of the color, Ravi? So the color shows a lot of turbulence as it goes past the LVOT. Uh, I might just slow it down for you. Where do you think it starts? It's starting like uh, from where that uh, ecogenic material is. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether Sam's already shown this one. He might have done, but anyway, I think it's good to, to re-show. You see how it starts? So the interesting thing about this lady, right, is that so we had those awful looking, you know, sort of three and a half meters per second sort of gradient through the aortic valve, but the aortic valve looked thin and pliable and it was opening, right? So that automatically raises your suspicion. Am I dealing with a subvalvular problem or supravalvular problem? Um, and what can we see here? So that's just a zoomed in view. Yeah. What we can also see is uh, we don't have ECG, but probably there is also a systole, like uh, you know, SAM systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. That's a possibility as well. But we don't have ECG. Uh, yeah. Sorry, ECG is there. Yeah, the ECG is just down here, but it's. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure there's any septal contact, but um, yeah, we'd need to interrogate that more. but. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else that you notice that's wrong here, uh, Ravi? What do you think of the aortic valve? And... So, aortic valve, uh, from whatever I can see, the cusps are opening well. Uh, The, like the non coronary or the left cusp. Uh... So what what do you think is causing the flow the flow to turbulence then? And then that proximal flow convergence that we could see before the valve. So it, uh... I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, no, all good. Um, can you? I might just point that out because it might just not be playing so well. Can you see this structure here? Yeah. Sprite epigenic. So that's it. That's a subaortic membrane. Membrane, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's good pattern recognition. So so you can have different types of subaortic membranes. The most common type of that sort of um you know sort of single sort of, um layer of of sort of um membrane uh, proximal to the to the aortic valve so this is subaortic stenosis um, and that's why in that previous one where we're seeing that um, you know the flow the color flow convergence it's actually not at the level of the valve we're seeing the aliasing just proxy see how it starts it's starting at the subaortic membrane uh, so this lady yeah. Yeah. so if ever you see someone with you know, with high gradients, right, going across their LVOT and their aortic valve looks absolutely normal. Obviously, you're going to look for dynamic outflow obstruction as well, um, but always have a really close look for subaortic membranes, which can obviously be quite tricky on TTE, um, and have a really, really low threshold for um, for, for toe, um, which is what happened with this lady. So that it's, it's a nice pattern recognition. Once you see it once, you'll not forget it. So subaortic membrane. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Um, quick couple of minutes just to go over this one. Um, maybe we'll have a free for all shout what you can see that might be abnormal. Um, or maybe I'll just quiz you. Uh, chat, what scallops are we looking at with this uh, mitral valve? And can you see any abnormality? So it was a 67 year old man. Um, he's with us in July last year, as we can see there. He came with shock and hypoxic respiratory failure. He wasn't intubated at this case, uh, stage, but he was really quite sick. And he'd been treated for about 24 hours as a community acquired pneumonia. And this is his echo. Uh, so I think it's A2P2 that I can see um, of the mitral valve scallops. The left atrium is enlarged. Um, the ventricle is impaired and there seems to be 
the, the aorta doesn't seem dilated. Yeah, look, just look at the ventricle a bit more, chat, and see whether you actually think it's impaired. No, I actually don't think it's impaired. I was, I couldn't see the inter inside margin of the inter, yes, in, of the um interventricular septum, and now I can um see it better. Yeah, just get used to calling that antraceptum, chat. Antraceptum, yeah. They're actually thickening pretty well, aren't they? It almost looks yeah. maybe like it's dynamic. a hyper dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, do you see anything wrong with the mitral valve? It's going really fast and I just need to slow it down and look at the ECG, yeah. but I feel like he probably is getting a bit of SAM actually. Uh, yeah, maybe it's really quite hard and I'm purposefully not showing you any color, but can you see that little structure there just flicking through? There. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so that's really quite subtle. But for me, this case is all about good 2D interrogation. You know, when we put color on this, you could, he, he actually didn't have classic severe, you know, um, regurgitant flow filling the whole left atrium because often with, and it, I'll end up showing you what it is, but um, cause, but what he did have is something called uh, color Doppler splay, where he just had this really sort of earliest um, color across his mitral valve. So he didn't have big color jets filling the whole left atrium. And you can see how on a focused echo, which is what he had initially, this abnormality here can be missed, right? And it's, it's, it's easy to do when you're just focusing on other things and, and doing a focused echo. But can you um, tell me the scallops that we can see here um, and what you think of the LV function here? Sorry, this one's not looping, but um, this is a zoomed in uh, apical four chamber. So what scallops would we normally see for the mitral valve on the four chamber? So I think now you can see... A point here. Um, so that's P1. Yeah. And then you can see A... A1, and I think you can see a bit of A2. Yeah, it might, maybe, China, I, it's, I find it always hard, but I guess the textbook is like, this is usually A2, A3, P1. Um, A2, but maybe A3, A2, 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 um, A2, A3, P1. Can you mm -hmm. notice any abnormality here in that mitral? So the LV function, I think, is very normal. In fact, I think it's hyperdynamic, having looked at these ones. Um, there is something flicking into the right into the left atrium i think yeah um yeah there and i actually think the um the way that i'm looking at it now i actually think the posterior leaflet might be prolapsing yeah. with the with the yeah. Yeah, i can't yeah. tell if it's artifact or not on my resolution on my screen but yeah well this is my this is my terrible imaging see i think you've got the focal point there the gains up it's all terrible <laughs> but um and, and I guess a learning point for me with this case, which is what I always say now, whenever you see a hyperdynamic left ventricle, you've got to explain it, right? So yeah. it's either because the patient has is vasoplegic and they've got a terribly low SVR for whatever reason, sepsis, I guess is the most common thing, post bypass and thing like that. But also yeah. don't forget, don't forget mitral valve pathology and severe. Yeah. You've got to explain that um, or a VSD, right? Um, yeah. We, you know, um, so it's for me, it's yeah, vasoplegia for whatever cause, significant mitral regurge or or a shunt. If you yeah. see, so you need to look for those three things, and and you'll probably get to it most of the time. All right, so the next, I might just quickly run through these. What leaflets would we see here in this three chamber again? My terrible imaging, but what would these usually be? And I can actually see it here, probably a bit more. Uh, 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 I think you can see. Yeah. Um. A A one P. I'm uh, sorry. A two P two. Yeah. Very nice. And you see how just the P two leaflet just looks. Yeah. See something flicking in the left atrium. Yeah. And again, you know, just just doesn't look just doesn't look right, does it? Just doesn't look right. Um. This mitral valve, and you've got a um hyperdynamic LV. All right. So we went to toe. Um. We intubated him and did a toe, and this is uh, what we can see. So what? Are we looking at here, uh, maybe Ravi, and what what scallops can we see? It's a bit of a trick question. Yeah, so this is a mid mid esophageal four or five chamber view. Yeah, somewhere in between, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, what we can see is 
the posterior mitral leaflet. So that could be the P1. That is, it looks like uh, it's ballooning into the LA, but I can see the tip flailing as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and because we're somewhere in between, and I'm just going to show you guys some pictures of how I remember the scallops, because we're somewhere in between a, um, a four and a five chamber, it's difficult to know whether we're looking at P1 plus or minus P2 um, and A1 plus or minus A2, because um, you're in that in-between phase, right? But whatever... Scott, and so you need more views essentially to know whether you're what exactly what scallop you're dealing with. I guess the most common um, scallop to, to flail and prolapse is P2, isn't it? Um, and that's you can see it's absolutely pointing into the left atrium. Um, so that is a flail. Okay, yeah. so we've got flail there um, of that of that scallop, and it could be that the adjacent scallop to it. So this might be P1 that we're catching, which is prolapsed, but then P2 is flailing is flailing in. It's it's really hard to tell, and we we definitely need more more views to interrogate that. But this is how I learn, and it's from a, and I can share this with you. It's the Bernstein Tor protocol, the simplified one. You might have seen it. I think it's excellent, um, and I'm just gonna show you talk you through how i um uh, know the scallops in, in when i'm doing toes so imagine that this is imagine that the toe probe is 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 behind here right so this is where my toe probe is it's coming down the esophagus and as if, I, if i stop it here this is what is in front of me okay so that that's what the toe probe is seeing so that when it puts out its ultrasound beam this is what it's looking at so therefore and you can see how, and this is it in a path, like a, a you know, a, a cadaveric specimen. And can you see how the mitral valve, it sort of looks like that crescent, it looks like a lunar, like a moon, right? So you've got the, all the posterior scallops, they look like a, a lunar, a crescent moon. And so this is how it's aligned. So then you can, you can work out where you're at with, um, when you're at zero degrees, therefore, because it's arranged this way, Right. So you just need to kind of once you have it in your mind that this is how the mitral valve looks at zero degrees of, as we're looking onto it. As soon as we go down to our midesophageal four chamber, this is the orientation that we're in. Right. So at zero degrees, I'm cutting through A, A2, P2. Yeah. And I'm going to come on to what then what then we will see as I move to 60 to one to 90 to 120. But at zero degrees. All I'm cutting through when I get to my midesophageal four chamber without the aortic valve in it, because I'm if I moved, if I pulled my probe up and had aortic valve in, I'd be cutting through A1, P1, right? Because I've just got zero on my omniplane. And then if I push my probe down a little bit more, I'm going to cut through A3, P3, right? So by just staying at zero, going to your midesophageal four chamber, by moving up and down, I can actually trace the whole of the, the mitral scallops. Okay, so you can see that in this next one here. So this is me coming down. I haven't done anything apart from go to about 40 centimeters, right? Stayed at zero degrees and I'm cutting through A2, P2. And if I pull my probe out a centimeter or so until I get the aortic valve in, because now I'm going to cut through this, I'm going to cut through a P1, A1. So can you see how on that patient that I just showed you, we, it's really hard to tell whether you're seeing P, P1 or P2, because it was kind of in between those things. Okay, that's, um, I think those scallops are quite easy to remember, but the hard, yeah, and as we push in, you know, you push in some more, you get A3P3. So th those are quite easy to remember, I think. And that tells you in that zero degree plane, tells you whether you've got an anterior leaflet problem or a posterior leaflet problem, but it doesn't really tell you with clarity what scallop it is. And that's why we need to um, use our Omniplane and, and 3D, I suppose. But just, I think before you move on to 3D, you absolutely need to understand how to do it with 2D and multiplane. So then as we come around to 60 degrees, can you see how now I'm changing my Omniplane to 60? Therefore, I'm gonna be cut, so this is our bicommissural view, right? So I'm gonna be cutting through P3, A2 and P1. Right, so there, that's what I'm cutting through as I'm coming to 60 degrees, P1, A2, P3. And I'm sure you'll be familiar with sort of that 
that's how it looks on on tour now if i and what i often do here is i'll rotate to the patient's left and that will give me p1 p2 p3 and the re the way that i know that i've moved from that bi classic bicomissural to all of the posteriors is i can't see coaptation anymore so therefore i know that all what i'm seeing is i move to the patient's left hand side right so just slight rotation to the patient's left i know that i'm seeing p1 p2 p3 and then the same if i just rotate slightly to the patient's right i'm seeing a1 a2 a3 mainly so you can you can fan through at 60 degrees and get a feel for what you're dealing with there as well um and then we move on to our 90 degrees right so at 90 degrees i've come through here so if you all you need to remember is this picture here. This is really key. And mainly what the AO, what the mitral valve looks like. And just remember the crescent moon is your posterior leaflet. Um, and that's how it's sort of cutting through. So at 90 degrees, I'm going to be going through A1, A2, A3, and a little bit of P3. Yes, if you could start, Chris, that would be awesome. Thank you. Um, sorry, guys, I've just got a, a total list coming up now. And you can see that here as well. A1, A2, A3, P3. All right, so that's in your, and see how we're getting a little bit of coronary sinus there next to P3 here. So anything that's, so if you see coronary sinus, your scallops have got to be A3 or P3. Whereas if you see appendage, your scallops are always going to be A1 or P1. So that's a nice little uh, trick as well. But I think if you remember the way that this is laid out and where you're rotating your omniplane, you can easily work out the scallops. And sometimes as I'm, when I'm doing a tour, I'll actually draw this on the board especially when I'm teaching, because um, if you if you know that's, that's what you're starting at, then you can work out with your omniplane what, what you're going to cut through. And then coming to 120, 120 is really easy, right? Because all you're cutting through there is A2P2. So the 120 one's really quite easy to remember. And again, if you rotate <clears throat> to the patient's <coughs> left, you're going to cut through A1P1. And if you cut to, look, look, rotate to the patient's right when you're in the 120, you're going to cut through A3P3. Right. And I guess, and that's what we can see, can't we, in the 120 long axis view. Um, and just as you were saying, Ravi, right coronary, and then it's difficult to know whether that's non or left. And you just need to uh, fan through that and biplane it and see what you're cutting through. Um, so with that in mind, I might just finish off in the last five sec uh, 10 seconds with a spot. I just want you to tell me what scallops we're looking at. Any of you can shout it out. So I'm going to put my pointer here and it's difficult. And if you say, I think it's this, but it's really hard to tell with certainty, I'd want to look at it in more planes. That's fine. So this is mid, mid esophageal four chamber. So A to P2, I would say. Very nice. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. It's difficult to know whether there's going to be a little bit of P1 in there because we're maybe just getting a little bit of aorta, but yeah, probably that, isn't it? And what do you think of the, of the, is there any abnormality here, Ravi? So there seems to be, a, you know, the posterior one is prolapsing. Very nice. Absolutely. Because, yeah, beyond the plane of the annulus and it's still convex. Very nice. Can you, can you appreciate that, Robert, as well? I'll just slow that down. You see that? You yeah. see how the tip, the tip is still pointing downwards um, rather than pointing up into the, into the atrium. So it's we prolapse there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So based on that, what direction is the mitral regurg going to be? Anterior. Very towards nice. the towards the left side of the screen. Very nice. Very nice. And you already know because you've got that significant two D abnormality that you're going to be dealing with severe mitral regurg, right? So we can see yeah. here, often. You know, with eccentric jets, you don't see that beautiful, um, you know, the whole left atrium doesn't fill with colour because we have that sort of um, eccentricity to it. And, and that can be underestimated, you know, if you only look at the colour in the receiving chamber. Um, and the key thing to look at absolutely is look for flow convergence. Right. So this this is really important. So if we see that proximal flow convergence, we know that we're dealing with at least moderate you know, if not um, at least moderate mitral regurg, that combined with the, the 2D defect, the prolapse, severe. But we'd, we'd obviously want to, um, 
you know quantitate that a little bit more i suppose um so so nice so always try to predict where you think the color jet's going to be based on your 2d anatomy um so what are we dealing with here so we're in the two chamber so 90 degrees what what leaflets are we looking at here so remember we've got that sort of crescent shape um posterior p1 p2 p3 and then that big sort of anterior leaflet abutted to it to make a full moon and we're at 90 degrees so this is p2 p3 a1 right no this is 90 this is not our bicommissural this is oh, 90. 90 i beg your pardon yeah yeah so remember we've we've got that i don't know whether this moon thing only seems to work for me but remember we've got that sort of the moon like that's so a p1 p2 p3 then we've got all of the aortic valve and i'm cutting through at 90 degrees right so i'm of the anterior leaflet so i'm going to cut through most of the anterior leaflet and just a little bit of p3 right because yeah. i'm at 90 degrees so we've got um a1 a2 a3 p3 oh. 90 degrees Emma, if, if you are not looking at the left atrial appendage, then we assume that it's slightly rotated rightwards. Yeah, it probably does need to be. You're right, Ravi. So we can see here coronary sinus. Okay, yeah, the, yeah. the coronary sinus is always with P3. And then the appendage, you've got a little bit of circumflex there. The appendage is here somewhere. Um, yeah, you just need to, probably you're going to see the appendage more between sort of 40 to 70 it depends obviously and then that leftward rotation you're absolutely right it's that sort of leftward rotation to rotate fully um in the appendage which you could open out yeah yeah um and this one again what are we looking at here this is the nice sort of you know 120 to 130 the long axis view um what what valves are we what leaf what scallops are we looking at here so remember, we've come around to 120 now with our, with our moon. A2, P2. Yeah, 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 nice. So I think um, as you're, when you're performing toes, just always just go through this structure. So you're going to start 0, 60, 90, 120. And as you go through those four, just say, that's what a leaf I'm looking at. Just say it over and over again, and then it will just become sort of brainstem level. And then you'll be able to move from the classic views to sort of more off axis views and still still know what you're looking at. And I still need to remind myself sometimes. I can't always remember. Um, yeah. So again, we're, we're seeing that P2 fla uh, prolapse slash flail. Um, and again, that lovely anteriorly directed eccentric jet with that massive proximal flow convergence. Um, and I was going to spend a little bit on, and then in 3D, um, which we all sort of cheat with now, don't we? Because it's quite easy to do this on the new fancy machines. But we can see um, what we have with 3D. Always your aorta at the 12 o'clock position. Um, antralateral commissure, posterior medial commissure. And then we've got this on FAS or surgeon's view. Um, and what we can see, so appendage is here, right? So we've got A1, A2, A3, P1, P2, P3. And this is your classic view, your on FAS view. And we've got this prolapsing can you see that that prolapsing p2 just coming through there um and then we can pop some color on and it's again showing that regurgitant jet coming through that prolapse there um, and this is that patient you know the patient that we started with the guy with the pneumonia that ended up having this um flail um you can see here a p2 flail just just sort of coming through maybe a little bit of p1 prolapse as well just coming through but the cordae is sort of ripped off and that's flailing through into his left atrium um, and that was that can you see how you could i don't know i feel like you could easily miss this like you know the regurge you wouldn't but like yeah well i guess you could but you see how it doesn't look that impressive in the left atrium so really key to look at where your 2d defect is which is obviously easy to spot so you know you're going to be dealing with severe mr but well, i guess my just my little key take home is always look for that proximal flow convergence um, really important for eccentric jets to make sure you're not going to underestimate them. I was going to talk to Pisa and how we could do that and when not to do it and caveats and things like that. But I'll talk about that another time. Um, and what's this last final final one? Because I've gone way over. I talk far too much. But what can we what can we see here? What is this and what's it telling us? It's that same patient, the one with the P2 prolapse. 
Sorry, I'm going to move that off there. Yeah. Is that the pulmonary vein? Very nice, yeah. Ravi. Yeah. Systolic right. flow reversal. Very nice. Very nice. So when, so can you all see that? So I might just go through. So this is our S wave. This is normally should be above the baseline, right? Going into the left atrium during systole, but it's completely reversing. I'm going back into the pulmonary veins during systole. That's why he was in pulmonary, he was in pulmonary edema and it was actually unilateral pulmonary edema. Um, and then in diastole, it's, it's obviously coming towards the baseline. And then we've got this little AR, which is normal. So this is our AR reversal, which is which is quite normal. But this systolic flow reversal is very abnormal. And you only see that in mitral regurge. In diastolic dysfunction, obviously, we can get systolic blunting. And in moderate mitral regurge, we can get systolic blunting. Because uh, normally your S wave is bigger than your D, right, in most, pe most people. But in young fit, fit athletes, you can get blunting of your S wave. Um, but if you see the systolic flow reversal, that's severe MR. Um, so that's that's a nice uh, way to, again, talking about, you know, not just relying on, never just relying on subjective and color assessment and 2D, putting everything together for severity of MR and always use these things. Okay, so how much can I answer with 2D? Um, how much can I answer with color? Um, what can I use for with pulse wave? What can I use with continuous wave? And then ideally you know it's not always possible in our patient group is in the critically ill but quantitative measures so if you're seeing you know disrupted mitral apparatus just like i've shown you there or sort of uh, down and upstream effects of your remodeling and um, with color doppler obviously just be mindful of the you know needing to hit the posterior wall of greater than 40 percent of your la size you don't always see that because it's about momentum um, and sometimes with those coanda effect, the, the, um, you don't always see that. Beaver contract is really quite useful, so more than seven millimeters because it's less flow dependent. It's quite easy to get. And then the PISA radius, um, you can use this as called like the easy PISA method or the simplified PISA method. If you do it correctly on a hollow systolic hemispheric jet, um, you know, in the right time, maybe you can use this PISA radius of more than one. Um, just as again a little marker that we're dealing with severe and then with pulse wave doppler um s wave reversal or blunting but definitely s wave reversal severe and also your e -wave velocity being more than 1.5 through your mitral inflow um is again supportive nothing nothing in isolation is is um, to be, is obviously you can't hang your hat on one thing and then continuous wave doppler we're obviously going to see that really dense uh, signal that's often triangular if, especially if it's acute severe mr because we get that rapid pressure equalization and then again for your exam you do need to kind of know some of these numbers so your effective regurgitant orifice area of more than 0.4 four centimeters squared um a volume mr volume of more than 60 and a fraction of mr of more than 50 percent um and yeah it's just a case of going through the guidelines and seeing those numbers um i think we'll leave it there guys but thanks um thanks very much for joining and any any we might just leave it there i might just uh, stop recording if you learned something hit like and subscribe to our channel for more videos uploaded weekly for bite-sized versions, follow us on Twitter at Echo Nepean and check out the tutorials. Or head over to our websites for the latest hands-on courses. Links in the channel banner. And thanks, thanks for watching. watching.